Electricity, a form of energy governed by the flow of charge. It's the reason you can watch this video and hear me speak. We're also electric. We're bioelectric. Within our bodies are electrical currents and electrical potentials that are generated by cells that make up our bodies. In fact, it's the reason we're alive. It's involved in neuronal signaling in our brains, enables our heart muscles to contract, and to transport glucose, to name a few. Disturbance of this electrical signaling has been implicated in many pathophysiological conditions, including cancer, diabetes, and heart failure. However, this bioelectrical signaling is also important for development and rejuvenation. And so this suggests if we can better understand these bioelectrical networks, it suggests a roadmap for exploiting bioelectrical signaling for interventions addressing developmental disorders, regenerative medicine, cancer reprogramming, and synthetic bioengineering. So hello, and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where if that intro got you excited, you're listening to the right video, as we're going to talk about the long-awaited topic of the bioelectrical network, or in other words, the information that is present in our bodies and that of all living organisms that comes from the transport of ions across a membrane. So we'll discuss what it is in more detail, why it's interesting, and how it could be exploited therapeutically for a variety of areas I mentioned in the intro. So before we jump into the biology, just a tiny bit of physics. Electricity. By definition, electricity is a form of energy resulting from the existence of charged particles. Or even simpler, electricity is the flow of charge. And guess what? As I just mentioned, we have charged particles in our bodies. And these charges can be moved across the membrane of cells by different proteins. Estimates are that 20 to 50% of our ATP supply, the energy currency of the cell, is actually used up by one of these cheeky proteins. This protein is currently in a membrane, and so that's good because it's a membrane protein and it's carrying ions across the membrane. But it's better to refer to it as its actual name, the sodium-potassium pump. It pumps ions, here sodium and potassium ions, across the cell membrane. So it takes sodium ions, which have a positive charge one direction, and potassium ions, which also have a positive charge in the other direction. And so we have movement of charges. And this movement requires energy in the form of ATP. But that's just one protein out of many that do similar things. That is, they move charged molecules across membranes. So, as you can see, our cells are electric. Now, this isn't just important for us functioning right now, but it was, and well so is, important for our development. How we went from one cell to fully grown humans. Now, you might be thinking, but you're wrong, the DNA has that information. Well, well yes, DNA has a lot of information, but we've sequenced the genome and there's no direct instruction for how to control the size, the shape, the symmetry and the structure of the body as it grows. So where does that information actually come from? Well, this is a fascinating question that's been of interest to many scientists, particularly developmental biologists, for a very long time, and also of the biologist Michael Levin, whose review article in inspired me making this video, as his research covers the intersection of bioelectricity with development and rejuvenation. He also tweets a lot about books he's reading, and I think he's now partly to blame for my humongous reading list. Anyway, what I mean to say is that genomics is not the only instructions available to a cell. And that's not really surprising. You see, biology can be noisy. Yet the final outcome, us humans, is pretty similar. We all have two eyes, a mouth, eyebrows, all in roughly the same region. And even crazier, cells can still work together to produce the final functioning organisms, even if you perturb the starting conditions. As you can see here, in this experiment performed in frogs, you can take a tadpole, so the, I guess the premature version of a frog, and make its face abnormal, and then rearrangement will occur such that a normal frog face is still built. And there's also experiments done in salamanders, whereby if you take the tail and graft it to the side of the salamander, it will remodel into a limb. And in some animals, if you amputate them, they can still produce a perfect replacement, which is madness. It's like, 
absolutely madness when you think about it. Except it's not, because something is clearly going on, something that we should be able to understand. The cells are clearly adapting to some radical, unpredictable changes in their morphogenesis. So, in the case of the tadpole frog example, with the face rearranging, there's clearly no genetically hardwired information for these rearrangements. Instead, the genome seems to be encoding some kind of cellular system that has plasticity. And this plasticity helps the organism cope with achieving the final morphology of the frog, despite these radical, unpredictable changes. So there is evidently some information above the genetic information. But how do the cells know when everything is in the right place? How did they know they were in the wrong place? Or if they were forming the wrong structure? Well, firstly, this brings us on to the idea of anatomical homeostasis. Basically, the idea that organisms can activate cell behaviours that somehow reduce the errors between the current state and the target morphological state, so the correctly formed organism. But the really important and interesting question is, well, how is this information specified and read by the cells? For example, what informs the developing organ that it's reached the correct shape and size without further growing to form a tumour? Well, what are the possibilities? I think there's at least three, one being biochemical signals, so what proteins or small molecules are present and how much of them. Secondly, biomechanical forces, physics like stretching and squashing or pressure. And then lastly, as I've kind of alluded to already in this video, bioelectrical communication. And so we're going to focus on that latter strategy for the remainder of this video. So as a brief recap, we've already established that our cells are electric and they're different from the cables that power our electrical devices, because here the electrical signals are coming from the movement of ions across the cell membrane, commonly sodium, potassium and calcium. And this is an, an essential feature of all living cells. And the cool thing is that it now seems that these electrical communications between and within cells can control things like gene expression and cell behaviour. So let's take a look at some examples to explain what I mean and then we'll discuss the potential for therapeutic intervention. So a very, very important concept to understand for this video is the fact that cells have a so-called electrical potential across their membrane. And this is because there's these different proteins that I've already shown you that can actively or passively move these ions across the membrane. And so because these ions have charges, you can end up with one side of the membrane being more positive than the other. And so the kind of fancy way of describing this is to say that if it's more positive, it's hyperpolarized, and if it's more negative, it's depolarized. And so it turns out our cells in kind of normal conditions have a more negative charge on the inside of the cell. And so typically we refer to this as its resting potential. And so altering then this electrical potential, making it more or less positive, turns out to be a key parameter in the regulation of cellular behaviours such as cellular replication, cell death and cell migration. Now, the beautiful thing is that you can have fancy dyes to detect the electrical potential and see them in model organisms. So take this image here of a planarian flatworm. What you can see here is that there are spatially organised bioelectrical patterns. There are red bits and bluer bits where red meaning depolarised, so has a more positive electrical potential, and blue means regions where it's more negative, so it's hyperpolarised. And these differences are thought to help determine polarity in the organism, so which region ends up becoming the head of the planarian, and which region ends up becoming the tail. So what then determines the bioelectric state? Well, quite simply, as I've mentioned, these the membrane potential depends on which and how much of these ions are present within the cell. And that depends on what proteins are expressed in the membrane of these cells that control the transport of these ions. So the expression of the ion channel proteins. And so, well, then what governs the expression of the ion channel proteins and their subsequent activation? Well, many things. But frankly, that isn't what we're going to focus on here. What's important to understand is that in response to changing environments, the activity of these channels can change, and with it, the resting potential. This change in potential can generate a signal within the cell to lead to the appropriate response, for example, a change in gene expression. Another interesting idea to understand is that two cells can have the same electrical potential, 
spot the potential may be generated by different ions and different channel proteins in the membrane. And the evidence currently suggests that a specific electrical potential can trigger, for example, eye development anywhere in the body, regardless of which ion channel protein, or even which ion, was used to implement that state of membrane potential. So let's return to that planarian I showed you earlier, with the red depolarized region forming a head, and the blue hyperpolarized section forming the tail. Well, the interesting thing is that experimentally, you can transiently perturb this pattern by using different blockers that inhibit proteins, such as drugs that inhibit these ion channel proteins. And so what that effectively does is it resets the membrane potential, and so it results in both sides of the planarian being depolarized. So what would you expect? Well, two heads, of course, which is what you can see here. And most interestingly is that these two headed worms, when they're cut and they can regenerate, they go on to keep making two headed worms. And so it also suggests that the bioelectric network exhibits memory. And this also provides direct evidence that perturbing the bioelectric network could have really strong phenotypic effects. But whilst this is all interesting, what about humans? And is there anything more relevant than having two heads? Well, this leads me on to the concept of morphoceuticals, therapeutics that could be used to aid in rejuvenation, treating developmental disorders, or maybe even cancer by altering these bioelectrical networks present in cells. And as stated in this review, there are four attractive reasons why intervening in bioelectric states could be valuable for the design of therapeutics. Firstly, as we've seen, small changes in this network can have a large effect in morphogenesis. So in other words, you can trigger large scale changes in growth and form without having to micromanage individual details. Secondly, it may act as an early decision making switch that selects downstream morphogenetic programs. In other words, the idea that a single treatment could have prolonged influences over the growth of the organism. Thirdly, there are many drugs already available that target these different ion channel proteins, they're so-called druggable. Obviously, you would first have to work out which channels you'd want to open and close and whereabouts in the body before you do it. And then lastly is the idea that the impact may not necessarily be local, as voltage patterns can also propagate, so you could have maybe long-range control, and this may help to target hard-to-reach sites. However, this also may be a complication if you wanted to target a specific place without having these long-range impacts. And so all in all, this morphoceutical idea is more of a top-down approach, which, if effective, could coordinate a myriad of downstream responses such that treatment may only be needed once as effectively you make a tweak in a higher level system and then you just let the body deal with the complexities. Now this research still is inevitably in the early stages, but it is very exciting to see how it may circumvent some of the challenges that are associated with other regenerative techniques, such as how exactly you get cells to form specific organs for replacement. You could just let the body deal with it. But there are also some great possibilities, as Michael even describes on Sean Carroll's podcast here. I think we just don't know the code enough. If we if we understood how to reprogram uh, correctly these uh, these target uh, patterns, I think we would be looking at something like an anatomical compiler. You know, this is like our our vision when I talk about what's the end game for our group. You know, when when can you give up and go home because everything's right. done. I think what we're looking at is something like an anatomical compiler that you sit down, much like computer aided drawing, you basically just draw a picture of a schematic of the animal or plant that you want. And if we knew what we were doing, the system would uh, decompose that into a set of stimuli that you would give cells to get them to build that particular thing. Not because you're going to micromanage, the, you know, the, the, you're not going to 3D print individual stem cell derivatives, but you're going to uh, rewrite the goal state that these cells are ac accessing, the, the cell collective, I should be more precise, the cell collective is accessing to know what to build and when to stop. But I do think this work is very fascinating, so much so I'm going to end with this quote that I found on Wikipedia, because I like it. Life is ultimately an electrochemical enterprise. As I said, I think there are many fascinating discoveries to come. So with that, thank you to my Patreon supporters, and thank you for listening.